أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد. Hello everyone and welcome to conversations about beauty and Islamic theology. Now today we are very fortunate to host calligrapher Nuria Garcia Masip. Just to give a very brief introduction, born in Ibiza. Spain, Nuria Garcia Matip is a master calligrapher and historian of Islamic art. Nuria first developed an interest in calligraphy after traveling to Morocco. In the year 2000, she returned to Washington, D.C., where she started studying the Rika, Sulus, and Nessi scripts with calligrapher Muhammad Zakaria. In 2004, she moved to Istanbul, where she continued to study the Sulus and Nessi scripts with Hattat Hassan Chelebi and with Hattat Dawud Bektash. In 2007, she received her diploma or ijazah in these two scripts signed by her three teachers. She holds a master's in art history from the Sorbonne University, has won prestigious prizes in international calligraphy competitions, and her work forms part of various private and museum collections. Her work is firmly rooted in the classical school of calligraphy, and she enjoys preserving the techniques and materials of the tradition. Nuria is currently living in Paris, where she teaches, researches, and works on calligraphy. Currently, she is completing her PhD at the Sorbonne on a fascinating topic, the importance and role of the levha, or large boards or panels inscribed with calligraphy in early tekkes or Sufi convents. So Nuria, it's a pleasure to have you here, welcome. Thank you very much, it's a pleasure. So Nuria, you, you've obviously got a ton of uh, experience with calligraphy, calligraphy both as uh, a researcher and as a practitioner. So perhaps we can start by asking what is the importance of beauty or aesthetic value in Islamic calligraphy? And is there some way that this beauty is defined or, or measured in, in your work or in the uh, historical examples that you've studied? Yes, well, um, calligraphy as its very name implies means beautiful writing. So beauty is definitely an integral part of, of this art form. And when we look at the early sources on calligraphy from the 11th century, which were very influenced by Neoplatonism and so on and Greek philosophers and so on, they always talk about calligraphy being a combination of um, perfection and harmony. And they have a whole series, if we look at the treatise, the very famous treatise by um, Tamahidi from the early 11th century, he has a, a whole series of elements that should be present in calligraphy. Um, for instance, accuracy, letter proportion, spacing, arranging the line evenly, rhythm of the words, nuance, exactness, exactness of strokes, and so on and so forth. Um, however, wh what they always add is that apart from these elements of perfection and harmony, you, it should also have an impact on the soul. And this is a more intangible element, which is difficult to define. Um, but it is important, I think, to, to note and to underline that it's not only the perfection um, of form, but that there is another element that has to touch um, the soul, and which is very difficult, I think, to define and to pinpoint. Um, but the three elements always seem to come together. So in that sense, is there, if it's supposed to touch the soul, then clearly there's some kind of um, meaning of calligraphy, which is beyond pure aesthetic measure, right? You know, yes. what, what, other, what other kind of significance does calligraphy have in Islamic culture apart from this kind of visual resonance? Well, I mean, I think calligraphy definitely transmits through two elements, text and form. And we have obviously, and normal, well, depending on the text, but normally it's used to transmit knowledge. Um, so I think, and then the form has many different multiple layers of meaning, no? depending on the script chosen, the size, the composition, which may go together with the text or not. Um, so all of these elements have to be deciphered and, and sort of um, understood you know, by the, the person who is beholding the piece. Um, but I think what is important to, to realize is that the letters, the Arabic letters in the collective imaginary, um, do have a, I mean, they seem to live in the world of forms and they are very much alive. And there are also all these associated meanings to the letters themselves. No? We have these Sufi treatises that talk about the symbolism um, of letters. I mean, 
you know, that um, there's this very famous treatise which Ana Maria Schimann has at the end of her book where um, I think it's from the Chisti order um, where you see that each letter symbolizes, yeah, I think Aleph is the universal intellect, Ha is the universal soul and so on and so forth. Uh, um, so that I think in the collective imaginary of um, any sort of more or less Muslim society, let's say, uh, um, that is very much alive still. And when people look at a piece of the calligraphy, there's an emotional response, which is linked to this perception of the sacred nature of the letters. And which is very intangible and very unconscious in my opinion, uh, for some people. But th there is definitely that, um, that link that, um, that, that makes the beholder become extremely uh, touched by a piece of calligraphy in a way that they wouldn't be by a, perhaps a figural representation or any other um, sort of, you know, any other sort of aesthetic representation because you don't have all those layers and layers and layers of meaning that is attached to the Arabic letter. Is that something that was uh, taught to you or is it something that has come up through your own kind of experience or, I mean, where, where do these no, kinds of ideas- No, no, no definitely not taught. Um, I always say that the, in the Turkish school, there's very little talking <laughs> and, and very little, I mean, I don't know your own experience, but um, my teachers, um, I think they taught by example. And for the first 15 years, basically the only thing you're doing is just copying and understanding form. And you're understanding form of a very particular school from a very particular time period, you know, 19th and <laughs> end of the 18th, 19th century and some 20th century examples. And, and you're, it's like a funnel and you just um, concentrate on that. And, and, and it's a whole discipline of just understanding those rules, those forms, those, um, you know, a whole aesthetic canon of a very particular place and time and so on. And then I think for me it was after, and of course you learn a lot about yourself, about your character and so on. And, and you learn a lot from the example of your teacher, but in terms of the theory of calligraphy, that was definitely something that I learned later, um, or maybe side as I went along and the more time passes, the more I understand, but I've had to do a lot of my own research. And then another thing that I, that I'm very grateful for is um, I've been in, I've been in contact more recently when I married my husband, who's an Iranian calligrapher, uh, Master Bahman Panahi. He opened for me the tradition of the Iranian school, and that also allowed me to understand other aspects of calligraphy. I, I think it put maybe a perspective on everything I had learned in the Ottoman school. You know, by compare and contrast, you all of a sudden you realize certain things that you thought were the only thing, and then. You see other ways of looking. And then my experience also with um, the Maghrebi context through Hamidi Bela, right? Um, and so on. So all these, I think everything has been complementary. So it's a combination perhaps of factors. It seems to me that the Iranian school is a lot more articulate with, or a lot more expressive when it comes to that treaties in, with regards to the role of spirituality in, in practice. I think I think in the Iranian school they have preserved, um, and I know that the Turks have a hard time, um, some of them have a hard time accepting this. There's a lot of, you know, there's a, a, a very old rivalry between, you know, the Iranian and the Ottoman schools, it goes back in history. Um, but I mean, there also has been an immense amount of exchange and many artists that were, you know, going back and forth between the two. So, um, but what is certain is that verbally, they have they are able to express and vocalize many things that come from the sources that the turks had mm. which the turks are no longer verbalizing and i think we need to remember that something that happened very important in the ottoman silsila in the 20th century was that halimos jayji passed away and hassan chalebi learned from hamid aitaj who was a wonderful calligrapher but who wouldn't speak Mm. and he would just correct masks. And that is my personal, um, I don't know, my, my mm. 
I don't know, I've thought about this <laughs> quite a bit. And, yeah. and I think that that might have a lot to do with the way calligraphy is taught today, which is they, because you follow the way your teacher taught you, um, then if your teacher didn't you know, verbalize certain things, then you also don't verbalize certain things, you see? And that, um, and also in my, so for instance, Mohamed Zekiria also, he, he talks, Mohamed Zekiria has done a lot of research on his own. So he does express certain things, um, but only to a point. And there may be also a little bit of, of um, the fact of not to give too much to the student when the student is not going to understand it. So I think there's also that understanding that they give you just enough. So just concentrate on this now, just concentrate on this now. And so it's like little steps. <laughs> And then after many, many years, perhaps it's when the student has the right questions that maybe answers will be given. Um, but it's not a, it's a, it's a complex, um, I, I don't think I have the answer, but my, that's been my experience in any case. Yeah. It's a fascinating thing because it, it raises the question of like how, how, whether knowledge should be articulated or vocalized or whether it can be expressed through other means like embodied Exactly. We spoke earlier about yeah. how the teacher leads by example, mm. Um, mm. which leads me on to my next question, which is what, why is there this emphasis in the historical tradition, at least on character, on adab, on the importance of the formation of the self when one is learning a particular Islamic craft like calligraphy? Yes. Well, already in all the treatises, they always um, make this equation between beautiful writing and beautiful character and so on. And there's that famous poem that I always quote by Mirali Kharavi that says, you know, the five things you need to be a calligrapher. And he says, um, beauty, uh, refinement of, of spirit, um, ability to endure suffering, um, you know, and, and a few things. But the, the fact is that the suffering and the, the, the the character, the refined character, meaning that you should be, that there is this element, and by refined character, I think they, they imply also having a certain level of intelligence, that all of that has to be present in order to be a, a good calligrapher. And, um, and so that is definitely present, first and foremost, in the way calligraphy is taught. <laughs> so the way they make the student repeat a lesson and they know, they, they test, to the patience of the student. If they see the, the student is getting impatient and they will make him wait even longer if they see that the student is um, getting a little bit, you know, too proud, then they will make him, you know, they will not even look at his mesh and all of those things, which I mean, I've basically gone through all, all of them, I think. And I was very conscious at the time that that's what was happening. So I was very happy to, to, to go through that, you know, I would, you know, travel for two hours to see my teacher and then he wouldn't even show up, you know, like all of that um, is part of the training of the student to, to definitely um, make sure that, um, that there's some work on, on the nafs, let's say on your attachments and so on. Um, so that's, that's the one level. And then at the other level, I think in your individual practice, you learn a lot about yourself. The fact that calligraphy is an art that has to be practiced when there's um, inner stillness. And if you don't have inner stillness, you need to find it somehow. Meaning if you're upset, if you're tired, if you're frustrated, um, if you're angry, you cannot do calligraphy. Um, so you need to put all of that aside and find that place inside of you where, where those feelings don't um, influence you. And I think it's very different from other arts such as painting or especially in the sort of modern contemporary understanding of painting and sculpture where it's all about emotion and showing your emotion and channeling your emotion and you know creating this um you know if you're angry then you know just take your brush and express it and <laughs> and where calligraphy it's precisely like the diametrical opposite um all of those feelings need to be put aside and you need to be detached from it. So I think we learn a lot from ourselves. It doesn't mean that we achieve any level of, um, you know, it doesn't mean that all calligraphers are saints by, by no means, but that calligraphers perhaps are more conscious of the inner, um, the inner flux of the soul, let's say, and, and that they are able to find a place to 
but I, I have to say that I do find certain pieces of calligraphy by certain, um, I'm talking now about historical figures that they had less of a, even though they were very beautiful and very perfect, they had less of a presence than other pieces that I find. Mm. And I don't know if that had to do with their inner um, state <laughs> or not. Mm. But I do think, and even today, I, I'll just say it, even today, there are many pieces of calligraphy that I find um, are not necessarily, they don't transmit the same way others do. Mm. I think we can say that. In that sense, can we, I mean, when we speak about this idea of like presence, of a work having a presence, mm. um, is that like a spiritual presence you're you're referring to or some kind of or is it the feeling that it gives you inside that it maybe brings you close to god or makes you feel i don't know stirs your soul perhaps yeah well you know in the in in Persian, they call it the sham of the piece so it's it's a kind of uh, energy or aura of the piece and i've actually spoken to to ustad panaki about this um you see that whoever has a certain sensitivity and they don't necessarily have to be a calligrapher. It can be a musician or somebody practicing another art or somebody who has that sort of openness. Um, they can definitely perceive that shun mm. from a certain piece and, and they can definitely distinguish even if they don't know anything about calligraphy, a piece that has a certain presence. And I think everyone who's gone into Hagia Sophia and seen those calligraphic panels have been complete, I mean, um, you don't have to be a calligrapher and you don't have to be in the world of Islamic calligraphy. Everybody's very touched by them because they have this energy that is immediate, no? Apart from the building and the context and so on. Mm -hmm. And and there are certain pieces of calligraphy that do that very, very clearly. Um, but I, I don't I I don't know how you can will for that to be present in a piece, you know? It's it's either there or it's not. And we don't really, <laughs> I mean those. You know, but there is that element of inspiration and which sometimes it exists and sometimes it's not. And, but I mean, I, I guess what we can say is that form and perfection is not enough, that there is another element that comes somehow. And I remember years ago, um, I listened to this lecture and I can't remember the name of the author. She had written a best uh, selling book. Uh, what was it? Eat, Pray, Love. Remember that became Oh extremely... yeah, in a movie with Julia Roberts. And, and she had to write a second book and she said, I don't know how many to do it. And then she said, well, finally, it's not about me. It's about the muses. <laughs> and so she was talking about this element of inspiration and you can call it any any anything you want but i think for any artistic endeavor there is this element of, you can call it the muses or you know there are different terms for it but that if that is present then the piece is very special and there are some pieces that are clearly inspired yeah i mean one of the things we we we're trying to discuss as part of the project is can objects be can objects uh, articulate or express theology can they bring one if the goal of theology is to help one understand the nature of god and bring one closer to god then can usually we rely on discourse to do yes. that practice but one of the things that contemporary islamic theology hasn't really brought into its purview is whether mm. objects can do this for yeah. us and it sounds like some of these pieces like the ones you've described have definitely no no I, I definitely think and i think that was the role of calligraphy i mean and the rise of the left hand precisely of the mobile calligraphic panel it's the the very conscious way of sacralizing a space so you have a room you hang a left and automatically there is that sacred um influence and the fact that the left of course you have it in the mosque you have it in the Sufi lodges, but then very soon it makes its way into the home. And I think that's a very um, important development for calligraphy, but that definitely responded to this, um, to, you know, the fact that when you have the left in the home, then you're, you're instantly reminded of the sacred. And, you know, it is an aid to, to, to contemplation, reflection, and, and remembrance. 
be, because you're a, this might seem like a strange question, but because you're a, a calligrapher and an art historian, do you ever find it difficult to just appreciate a work of calligraphy without being, without, you know, looking at the date or saying, oh, that dal is done in a really interesting way, or maybe I can use that compositional style. Or are you uh, no, no, I, I'm, I, no, I'm not like that at all. I actually am very emotional when it comes to calligraphy. I'm very, I get very touched and um, kind of struck by pieces. That's my perception with calligraphy. And then, then I'll go and analyze and so on. But I'm, I go very much with my first initial impression and I, and it touches me very, very deeply and very, um, it's very difficult to describe. It's something very, very profound and I, it's definitely not on the mental plane. Is there, is there any pieces in, in Istanbul, like uh, outdoor pieces or pieces in, you've mentioned the Hagia Sophia that, that have really, that you can recommend people to visit or that for these kinds of, for this kind of shan or, or experience or, or even the ones that really resonated with you? Like well, I love I love any piece by Ahmed Karahi Sadi. I, I absolutely love, and of course the pieces at Hagia Sophia. Um, but I think I've been most struck sometimes by by I was very struck by the pieces in the Timurid albums that I was able to look at it, um, when I was at the Topkapi library to research and um and there are some pieces there which are completely they haven't been published and you know, they're very um they're, they're very difficult to access and so on but th some of the pieces there were really astounding and and then there are many many masterworks from the ottoman period but i not i i think i'm i'm more touched by the pieces that i can hold and and look not necessarily right. the sort of inscriptions on I think I'm I'm more touched now that you've asked. I've never thought about this until you asked me the question, but I am immediately. It's more direct when you see the calligraphers' work, meaning not. Uh, and this is why the lefa interests me because one thing is um, something that has been transferred by a craftsman or by you know the the the, the craftsmen who were in charge of transferring the calib. Uh, and, and making the final piece. The pieces by Aya Sophia were made by Isette Fendi and his students. Um, but many of them, for instance, the ones of Karahisari of the Suleimani Mosque, were just transferred by the craftsmen with the caliph and so on. Um, so I'm, I'm more struck by the pieces that are ink on paper mm. um, and that I can see what's happening with the ink. And, and I think that the black ink and the flow of the pen and the breath of the pen, I think they capture the essence of calligraphy much better than um, the sort of the Z and pieces, which we find more in the architectural context. One, one calligrapher that is often highlighted as an example of uh, where their character may have influenced the writing size, so Mahmoud Jalaluddin. Yes, yes. Enjoy. I like Mahmoud Jalaluddin. I've also thought about that. Why did they give him such a hard time? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it makes you question could, because you know he was supposed to supposedly had a a questionable character or arrogance or stubbornness, but nevertheless, not only was is his writing beautiful, but it was also successful yeah. um, for one or two it's generations. It died extremely out extremely but... productive. Yeah, I love yeah. I love the pieces by this is why I think when we talk about perfection of character, it's that's what I said, not all calligraphers are saints. And we know many calligraphers, we definitely, we can all work on ourselves. And, you know, we all have our, our faults and, and so on. So this is why it's not, it's not that you are a perfect person, but it's that you're able to, to find that space. I think maybe that's where we can make the difference because the pieces by Mahmoud Jalal al -Din, and God knows best, but I mean, he definitely they have a lot of some of them have a lot of shan and just beautiful very powerful energy i think and then the pieces of karahisari we don't know what his character was but um those are wonderful wonderful pieces yeah mm -hmm. who was also kind of ignored later you know but it's, it's amazing and what, what um now that you're an art historian 
uh, well, not now that you're not, you've always been a, a, in, in the world of academia, but to what extent do you think your ability to understand calligraphy from the inside as a practitioner helps you as an academic? Yes, well, um, I think the fact that, that um, as calligraphers, we go through this training of training your eye, uh, you know, the ghost of BSc, the, the education of the eye, um, the fact, as we were saying earlier, that you're just analyzing certain models and studying a very precise aesthetic where, you know, one hair wider, one hair narrower makes a huge difference. I mean, that's a sort of training that, <laughs> that we're going through. So having done that, then it's very easy to look at any other uh, sort of calligraphy from any other period. And immediately you see the faults and you see the, um, the virtues, let's say, and you're able to, to pick up details that um, others may not. Um, and I, I've seen that very clearly now that we're doing work on non-canonized, non-canonic, sorry, scripts, um, you know, such as the Sub-Saharan African scripts or the Bihari from India or Southeast Asia that are clearly non-classical scripts and they were codified very loosely, but immediately having the training of the calligraphy, you're able to pick up uh, very quickly all the different um, characteristics of a script. Um, but I, I do have to say that I think for calligraphers, it is very important to read and go back to the sources. And um, it's definitely not enough to just be able to, not to have the, the calligraphic sort of practical training is very useful, but I think it definitely has to be combined with the, the research and the reading of the sources. Yeah, it's very, very enriching for the calligrapher. Maria, just a, a couple more um, questions. Um, so the first one is, what have you noticed any parallels between calligraphy? We spoke about the importance of adab and character formation, for example. Have you noticed any parallels between calligraphy and other forms of Islamic knowledge in your research? Um, yes, well, I think there are sort of obvious parallels with uh, Sufism and um, you know the, the relationship between master and student. Obviously, I'm not equating them at the same level but you know there are, it's kind of reflects a certain um especially in the master student relationship and the train traditionally not necessarily today um and i think today it's definitely the master student relationship is being it has become very difficult and it's being lost i mean as we speak um as i mean i mean the true master student relationship as it was in, in the past um, and then um, with other forms, I, I, I have students who, who have done Tajweed and they tell me that there are many, many parallels with the science of Tajweed and so on, but I'm not familiar enough with the other forms of mm. Islamic sciences to make other parallels. Yeah, th this thing about the master-student relationship with the Ottoman Empire is really, for me, it's really fascinating. It's uh, something that has like, inspired my ever since I became an academic it's something that I really wanted to focus on and one of the things that I really get struck by is that students would be buried next to their masters ahead of their own spouses children mm -hmm. parents even sometimes ahead of their own Sufi sheikhs and yes. for us nowadays like you said for, for people that have studied calligraphy it, it might seem strange because I would I choose to be buried in you know with my own teacher it doesn't enter our consciousness because we weren't trained in that particular way yeah, but it's exactly. really fascinating yes thing, yes no? yes it's very fascinating and i think yeah that level of intimacy because there was a sort of an intimacy and in at a very deep level and unfortunately it's just not possible in, in today's context i think or i mean maybe it is possible but just the, you know the, the way we live and the way you know it's changing and um last question nuria uh, it's a, a rather personal question um so feel free to take it wherever you want to, to go which is what is the role of of religion or faith or personal practice or ritual in your own approach to islamic calligraphy well for me it, it's a very strong um presence and and 
that's what, I mean, for me, it's like the main source of inspiration, I have to say. I, um, when, I when I choose a text um, to, to write or to make a piece, I never go, I know some calligraphers, they will, they will choose it on the basis of the calligraphic forms, like if it has a lot of wows, if it has a lot of chanaks. And I, I've never done that. I, I always go when I really love the meaning and I have to be very moved by the meaning. And then that's like my driving force to make a piece. And that's how I, um, that, that's how I conceive of pieces. And then I have pieces which are a little bit, they, they come about very easily, kind of like on their own. I mean, we were talking about the muses earlier. Somehow they, you know, like I'll, I'll actually visualize them, but that's rare. And then there are others that need a lot of work and, and, and I'll get frustrated and impatient because why is this composition not working? But, you know, but I love the text, so I have to, you know, and so that's a whole other process. And, um, but definitely it all starts with, with a meaning. So obviously Quranic ayats, and I always choose Quranic ayats. For me, it's very important that they have to be able to be understood by absolutely everyone, not only Muslims. Like that's very important for me, like the universality of the message. Um, I have done pieces that are more specific, obviously for, for the Islamic context, but of course, but I mean, I, I particularly like the ones that are more, um, you know, that can really reach anyone that when they, when they read it, when they see it, they, they wouldn't know necessarily where it comes from, but that they're touched by its truth. Um, and then, and then obviously I, I love mystical poetry. So, but that is difficult to find good verses. Is there, is there ever a case where you, where you just, you love the text, but you just can't make it work in a composition and you just have to yes, 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 do yes. it yes. regardless. <laughs> yes, there are, there are, yes. Like for instance, during the coronavirus, um, a very dear friend sent me a very beautiful dua, a little prayer for protection. And I really wanted to write it and, and I wrote it and I had all these different versions and my, my main critic now is my husband. <laughs> he kept saying, no, it doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. It's like, but if I do this and, and he was like, just write it for yourself, put it up on your desk. Like it doesn't have to be a final piece, you know? And finally that it's in this sort of sketch. I have it there hanging next to my desk. Um, it's not a good, yeah, it doesn't really lend itself. Yeah. And is there a moment when, 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 like when you know that this piece is done, is there a, my teacher says, for example, that the moment is when it stops speaking to you. That's the way that he describes it. And, oh. and for yourself, is there like a particular moment when you think, you know what, no more tashi, no more corrections, no yeah, more, I'm yeah. done. It's difficult, especially because in the Ottoman school, we have this obsession with tashi and the sort of cleaning of the letters, which can be very, um, uh, well, it, it can make look, your calligraphy look very beautiful or it can completely kill it. So we have to be very careful with and I think I've become less and less obsessed with Tassi with time. At the beginning, I would completely overdo it. I mean, I would, with a magnifying glass and so on for days. Um, and now, now I'm, I'm a little bit more detached. I, I find that I spend a lot of time on the process of making the piece. Um, and then as I'm working on the piece, it gets like quicker and quicker towards the end. And when I'm getting to the end, I start getting very impatient. I want to finish, like for some reason, which is not good because for instance, I, I know I'm very conscious. I have a weakness in the hareke and the vowels. And that's because I'm getting close to the end. Like my signature is probably one of the weakest points on all my pieces. I don't like signing my pieces. It's like, it's finished. So I'm like, it's very, uh, I don't know why I've never thought about this, but it's, it's definitely a, a tendency I have, which is very, very patient. Like I can be working on a, a sketch for like months, you know, like I put it, I come back and so on. And then, um, so, so I, I tend to, so I, actually I'm not answering your question. So when is a piece finished? It's basically at this very 
ending stages where I can just see everything has come and now I just have to leave it. Mm. Yeah. Nuria, thank you. It's a wonderful way to, I guess, to, speaking about a conclusion at the conclusion of our uh, discussion. Thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and your insight. And we're going to add a, a link to uh, Nuria's website for everyone so they can really see some beautiful examples of her work. I know that she's too humble to suggest that her work may have any shan or, or magnificence or presence, but I can assure everyone that uh, that they will really gain something from looking at these pieces. It's only a shame that we can't see these pieces in person. So um, thank you so much again, uh, Nuria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.